In this video, we're going to continue our look at colligative properties and some problem solving involving them. This is for the solutions unit of grade 11 advanced chemistry. Colligative properties, you remember, involve vapor pressure lowering. That would be using Raoult's law. Uh, freezing point depression, boiling point elevation, and osmotic pressure. These are uh, properties of solutions that change when you dissolve solutes in them, and the magnitude of the change depends only on the number of particles present, not on the nature of those particles. So question number four, the solution is made by dissolving five grams of calcium chloride in 50 grams of water. Um, at the same temperature, water has a vapor pressure, so that phrase vapor pressure jumps out at me, of 17.5 millimeters mercury. Um, what would be the vapor pressure above this solution? So since this is dealing with vapor pressure, this is vapor pressure lowering, and specifically a question involving Raoult's law. Okay, Raoult's law, let me just switch pens here. Raoult's law says that the vapor pressure above the solution. Now, the thing that's evaporating in this solution is water, so we'll say Pw is equal to the mole fraction of the water, of the substance of the solvent, multiplied by the vapor pressure of the pure solvent, or in this case, the pure water. And that degree symbol signifies the vapor pressure of pure water. It's important to understand that in this question, the solute calcium chloride is non-volatile. That means it does not evaporate. It, uh, it's a salt, so it does not evaporate. Now, as a salt, though, it is an electrolyte, so it's going to ionize. And looking at it, CaCl2, when it breaks apart, one mole of CaCl2 will give us one mole of calcium ions, but it will also give us two moles of chloride ions for a total of three particles. So we know that the Van Hoff factor in this case would be three. You get three particles for every one formula unit of salt that ionizes. Now looking at the question again, we want to know what's the vapor pressure above the solution. So this is what we're looking for. We were told that the water itself has a vapor pressure of 17 and a half millimeters mercury. So if we find the mole fraction of water, we just multiply by 17 and a half millimeters mercury, the vapor pressure of the pure water. So let's go find the mole fraction of the water. To do that, we'll first note that we have five grams of calcium chloride, so let's convert that to moles. Five grams of calcium chloride. We'll get rid of grams, switch to moles of calcium chloride. Now, if our solute was molecular, this is what we would do, and we'd stop here. We'd then go get the mole fraction. Now, this solute is ionic, so it's going to split, as we just said, into three particles. So let's get rid of the moles of calcium chloride and replace with moles of ions, okay, or moles of particles, moles of solute particles. The first unit multiplier is the molar mass of calcium chloride. So let's use a calculator and quickly evaluate that. We have calcium 40.08 and two chlorines, 3545, 110.98 grams per mole. And then from our discussion earlier, we saw that three moles of ions come from one mole of calcium chloride. So we're going to get, in the end, five grams divided by 110.98 and multiplied by 3, we get 0.135 or 0.14 as the number of moles of ions in the water. Now, the water itself, we were told, was 50 grams, so let's take 50 grams of water and find how many moles that is. One mole of water. 18.02 grams, so 50 divided by 18.02, 2.77 moles of water. And I'm trying to pay some attention to significant digits as I do these calculations. 
So now that we've got the moles of water and moles of the solute ions, we can find the mole fraction of the water. It's equal to the moles of the water divided by the total moles, or moles of water plus moles of ions. And that's going to equal 2.77 over 2.77 plus 0.14. And we can tell looking at that that the mole fraction is going to be close to 1. 2.77 divided by 2.77 plus 0 0.14, 0.95, 0.952 is the mole fraction of the water in this solution. And that's something to keep in mind. When you, whenever you make a solution, even a pretty concentrated one, you'll still have, in terms of mole fractions, mostly solvent. So we have 0.952 as the mole fraction of the water, and now we can just multiply those two things. The reason it's important to remember that you have mostly solvent is that when you do a vapor pressure lowering question, on a, say a multiple choice portion of a test, you sometimes don't even need to do the calculations when you look at the multiple choice answers. We would, we would predict that the vapor pressure here has to be less than 17.5, so anything that was greater than or equal to 17.5 in a multiple choice question would be wrong automatically because the concept is lowering of vapor pressure. And then we, were, we would expect that the vapor pressure of the solution to be close to 17.5, but not exactly, not, not equal, but close to. And sure enough, that's what we're going to see here, 0.952 times 17.5, 16.7 millimeters mercury. So if there was a choice of 16 and another choice of, say, 5 millimeters mercury, you could reason that it's almost certainly going to be the 16, because although there is vapor pressure lowering, it's not a huge lowering okay, in a solution. So there's a Raoult's Law of Vapor Pressure Lowering question. The next example, the phrase osmotic pressure jumps out at me. Calculate the osmotic pr pressure of a solution made by dissolving sucrose in enough water to make 50 milliliters. The equation for osmotic pressure was derived from the ideal gas law. Pi the Greek letter P for pressure, and we're using that so that we don't confuse this with the ideal gas law. I is the Van't Hoff factor, again, which refers to the solute, and, uh, whether it's an electrolyte or a non-electrolyte. C is the molarity of the solution, the concentration molarity. R is the ideal gas constant, and the unit, the value for R will determine the units for the pressure or vice versa and temperature as in the ideal gas law needs to be in Kelvin. Now this question didn't actually mention the temperature. That was a typographical error. We need to include that. It was left out by accident. So we'll say that the temperature here was 25 degrees Celsius. Let's just say 25 degrees Celsius. So we want to calculate the osmotic pressure. We notice that sucrose, the solute, has a formula C12H22O11. That tells me because of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, all non-metals, this is almost certainly a molecular substance, and so the Van't Hoff factor would be one. It's a non-electrolyte. Electrolytes in grade 11 chemistry are typically ionic compounds, so they're going to start with metals and then have non-metals or complex ions with them. We need to know the molarity, which we'll calculate in just a moment. It says express the answer for pressure in atmospheres. So let's use 0 0.0821 as our value for the ideal gas constant. And 25 degrees Celsius, 298 Kelvin, when we add 273 to that. So to find the osmotic pressure, all we need to know is the concentration. So let's go find that. Concentration, there's, you could do this in two ways. We could start by finding the moles of, su of sucrose. It's equal to mass divided by the molar mass of sucrose. Once we have the moles of sucrose, then we could say concentration is moles divided by liters, so we could use that formula. We know the mass of sucrose, we can get its molar mass, so we have moles. And we know the volume of our solution, 50 milliliters, so we could find concentration. I prefer to use unit multipliers for this. I'll just take my 20 grams of sucrose 
and I'll convert the grams to moles. And then to get a concentration, I just divide by volume. And the volume here was given in milliliters, so I'll put that in first. But then I remember it has to be moles per liter. So I'll, one more multiplier, convert my milliliters to liters. And when I look at the units for this, I'm left with moles per liter, which is concentration. So one mole of sucrose, let's calculate that molar mass. We have 12 times 12.01, 12, 12 carbons. 22 times 1.01, 1 .01, 22 hydrogens. And 11 times 16, 11 oxygens. So 342.34 grams per mole. There were 50 milliliters of solution and there's a thousand milliliters per liter. So grabbing the calculator again, we have 20 grams divided by the molar mass, divided by 50 times by a thousand, we get 1.17 molarity or 1.17 moles per liter if you prefer. So let's take that answer for concentration and put it back into our formula, 1.17 molarity. And now we can evaluate the osmotic pressure, 1.17 times 0.0821 times 298. We get 28.6 atmospheres of pressure. Now remember what that answer means. If we have this 50 mils of sugar solution poured into, just as an example, poured into a, a tube like this, a U-shaped tube, and we put the sugar solution on one side. On the other side, we just put pure water. We know that because of the difference in concentration of sugar, this membrane prevents sugar from diffusing across, so there can be no diffusion. We know then that water is going to want to go across the membrane in this direction by osmosis. It's going to go from an area of low solute concentration to an area of higher in order to dilute that sugar solution and bring the concentration levels much, easier, much closer together. So we expect this level to go up and this level to drop as the water undergoes osmosis. What our answer says that is that if we were to apply 28.6 atmospheres of pressure, we would be able to prevent that osmosis from happening. If we were to apply a greater pressure than that, then we could actually do what's called reverse osmosis. We could force the water back from the sugar solution into the pure water portion, and that's one way of purifying drinking water by doing what's called reverse osmosis. All right, let's take a look at another example, number six. What mass of ammonium phosphate must be added to 500 grams of water so that the freezing point is lowered to minus 8.3 degrees Celsius? And we'll assume that ammonium phosphate completely dissociates as we do this. We know that ammonium phosphate has three ammoniums and one phosphate ion. So three ammoniums and one phosphate tells me that its Van't Hoff factor is going to be four. And so when it says, assume that it completely dissociates, it's telling us to assume that I is four. All right, so we want freezing point. So the freezing point change equation comes to mind, I, K, F, times molality. I is the Van't Hoff factor, which we know. Kf is the freezing point constant, and it refers to the solvent, in this case for water. We would look that constant up. Okay? We have a data booklet that has a table of these constants in it. So here's our table of freezing point constants for water. We're reminded that it freezes normally at zero degrees Celsius, and it has this freezing point constant, 1.86 degrees Celsius per molal. So 1.86 is the value for Kf. Now molality, we remember, is moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. So we can take our formula and change molality to moles of the, of the solute I'll just say moles of AP, ammonium phosphate, divided by 
the kilograms of water, which is our solvent. But moles is mass divided by molar mass. So we get, we can replace the moles of ammonium phosphate with mass of ammonium phosphate divided, whoops, a P ammonium phosphate, divided by the molar mass of ammonium phosphate, and we still have that kilograms of water. So we're just doing some algebra here, delta TF equals this. The question is looking for the mass of ammonium phosphate that we would need to get the freezing point of a 500 gram sample of water down from zero to minus 8.3. So we could calculate what delta Tf is equal to. Delta Tf is the absolute value of the normal freezing point of water, so zero degrees Celsius, minus the freezing point that we're trying to achieve, which is negative 8.3 degrees Celsius. And so when you subtract and take an absolute value, you'll get 8.3 as our delta Tf. So we know delta Tf. We know I, we know Kf, we know the molar mass of ammonium phosphate, we can just look that up, and 500 grams of water, we know how many kilograms of water there are. So let's just rearrange the formula. The mass of ammonium phosphate is equal to delta Tf times the molar mass of ammonium phosphate times the kilograms of water divided by the Van Hoff factor and Kf. So now let's substitute into our rearranged formula. We have 8.3 is our change in temperature. The molar mass of ammonium phosphate, just quickly evaluate that. We have 3 times 14.01 plus 12 times 1.01 plus 30.97 phosphorus and 4 times 16 the oxygens. 149.12 is the molar mass of ammonium phosphate. We had 500 grams of water. 500 grams, get rid of grams, switch to kilograms, is 0.5 kilograms of water. and divide by the Van Hoff factor, which was 4 in this case, and the Kf was 1.86, and we got that again from that table. So with our calculator one more time, let's evaluate 8.3 times 149.12 times 0.5, divide by 4, and divide by 1.86, and we get 83.2 grams, or 83, if we just round it off to two sig figs, 83 grams of the ammonium phosphate should be dissolved in the 500 grams of water, and we would then have a solution which freezes at minus 8.3 degrees Celsius. So there's just a few more problems done with colligative properties. Hope that helps in terms of preparing for your web assignments or for your test or exam. So good luck.